This is very exciting. Hi, this is Dale Peterson, and welcome to the Unsolicited Response Show. Joining my, me on this week's episode is Kelly Shortridge. She is a senior principal engineer at Fastly, and she recently, in 2023, wrote a book called Security Chaos Engineering, Sustaining Resilience in Software and Systems. And that's why we want to have you on the show, Kelly, because I wanted to talk to you about your new book. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, let's start with the basics. Can you give our audience, which is primarily people involved in ICS security, can you give them the one to two minute description, broadly speaking, of what chaos engineering is? Absolutely. Um, security chaos engineering, when you hear it, think resilience. Um, it is kind of the the buzzword du jour, let's say, um, that I certainly had no problems glomming onto, but really it's the subtitle that's kind of the uh, essence of the book, which is sustaining resilience. So it's natural to think, okay, so what does resilience mean, right? If resilience is the underpinning, the, the philosophy, the philosophical foundation of security chaos engineering, what is it? So resilience is really about the ability to prepare for, plan for, um, recover from and adapt to failures and opportunities alike. And it's really that uh, that adaptive capacity, um, being able to adapt to the unknown, that's the essence of resilience. It's, you know, it's the philosophy that failure is inevitable. It's going to happen. There's really nothing we can do to stop it in any sort of complex system, which most of the systems we interact with in our daily lives and certainly in our software lives and definitely in the ICS space, they're all complex systems. So we can't prevent failure. Do we just give up? No, obviously it's that failure is inevitable, then we prepare for it. We learn from it. We make sure that we can adapt to whatever we end up facing, you know, whatever surprises and stressors happen. So the book is really um, all about, okay, we have these messy systems. How do we ensure these systems stay successful despite the presence of attackers? You know, one of the quotes that seemed very apt for our industry um, in security chaos engineering was, you wrote, minimizing the consequences of surprises rather than minimizing the probability of damages, which is, we have something that's been happening in the ICS world where there's been a focus on consequence, whether there's a methodology called CCE, there's cyber informed engineering, where they're all saying, Yes, we want to stop attacks from happening, but we also, if they do happen, we want to make sure they don't have as big of an impact. How, how does what you're talking about here relate to that concept? Oh, it's completely aligned. Um, I couldn't agree more. I think at some point I say as politely as I can that um, trying to assess prob probability is a bunch of BS. Uh, it's not very helpful. It can feel very scientific because we deal with numbers and statistics, but ultimately, what does that tell you, right? There's a quote, I think I, I have in the book as well, by Susan Elizabeth Howe, who's a geologist, who says, a building doesn't care whether an earthquake was predicted or not. It either withstands the shaking or it doesn't. And I think that really gets to the heart of matter, right? Especially with uh, critical infrastructure systems, which is you know, it doesn't matter what the probability was. It could be 1%, it could be 90%. The point is that we don't want the failure to be that impactful. We want to make sure, especially in an ICS context, that it doesn't cause like a meltdown. It doesn't cause a more systemic failure, that there's like a failure in kind of a small way that we can contain and recover from quickly. In some sense, that's all right. What we don't want is that, again, like catastrophe scenario where things are avalanching through our systems, where we can no longer be operational. Those are the things that we want to prepare for and make sure that we can be adaptive enough to avoid such consequences, right? So to me, it's totally aligned with the initiatives you were talking about. And just one other thing before we dive into kind of the methodology, especially the evaluation and, and experimentation, you, you wrote uh, early on a, about the difference of fail safe versus safe to fail. And it, it made sense, but I'm wondering in our world, we have safety systems and protection systems that are designed essentially if the temperature exceeds this value or if the sensor reading exceeds or is above or below a threshold, shut the whole thing down safely so it doesn't damage equipment, so it doesn't cause human life. Is that what you mean by fail safe? Because in your book, you're saying we should really focus on safe to fail. 
would would a system like that be in the safe to fail category or the fail safe category? I think it depends on your perspective. To me, that's still kind of the element of adaptation, right? Um, there's another concept in the book that I talk about that's applicable to any sort of complex system, which is the idea of, um, and I didn't come up with this, by the way, it's the boundaries of safe operation, right? There's a point at which a system is no longer resilient to the stress or our surprise or to the failure. And that's when it tips over um, into these kind of like failure scenarios that are especially bad, right? To me, like what we want to be able to do is to adapt the system to make sure it stays within its boundaries of safe operation to make sure that it doesn't tip into this kind of catastrophic failure scenario. So what you talk about to me, yes, in an ideal world, would we design a system that's able to like automatically like cool off and like all these things? Sure. Right. And I know sometimes that happens. But the key thing is we don't want to design the system assuming that it can prevent the failure. Right. What you talk about to me is about recovery from the failure. Like okay, it's exceeding our kind of like safe boundary, let's shut it down. That is the adaptive response. Um, so to me, that's that's still aligned to safe to fail. I, I also want to stress in the book, like um, I was trying to cover all sorts of systems, whether ICS, yeah, sure. certainly your kind of traditional SaaS, like software systems, distributed systems, even firmware and hardware. I'm thinking about like chip manufacturers. So it, it kind of covers the gamut. So like you said, like it's going to be very contextual, but to me it's, you want to look for like, okay, where have we tried to prevent failure versus when are we trying to respond gracefully to failure? And I think what you described definitely falls into the category of trying to respond gracefully, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'd agree. I think it's just a, a wording thing. Well, let's dive into it now. Uh, I would say, of course, you as an author, you want people to read every word of your book, of course. <laughs> but I would say if, if you were only going to read one chapter, to me, chapter two was the most valuable uh, because it it hit this, uh, what you call E&E, &E, this evaluation and experimentation approach uh, that's part of security chaos engineering. What, you start out with evaluation and you said you can do evaluation without experimentation. So you can, experimentation makes people very nervous uh, <laughs> in all worlds and especially in the ICS world. But you were saying there's value in the evaluation side of it, even if you choose not to do the experimentation. Maybe could you give a, a couple of examples of where you could receive value from just doing evaluation? Oh, definitely. I see this a lot, actually, when I do, um, whether it's internally at Fastly, I've done it. Um, and certainly when I'm consulting and advising organizations on their security or resilience strategy, I've seen this. Time and time again. So without conducting experiment, if you use something called decision trees, um, which I talk about in that chapter you referenced, um, that can really illuminate where you may have gaps in your understanding of the system. What I describe as mental models. Those are our kind of internal representations of our external reality. We have them about our systems. They're definitely incomplete, especially as our systems change over time and operating conditions change. So the idea with the decision tree is that you are essentially doing an if this, then that sort of flow about a failure the system could encounter. Um, traditionally, in the example I give in the book, you're talking about like if a failure perform, uh, if an attacker uh, performs some sort of action, you know, and we implement some sort of mitigation, what will they do in response? Because obviously they're not just going to give up. They might try something else. You can actually mm -hmm. apply this. I talked about this at SRECon earlier this year. You can apply the same approach to failures that don't involve attackers, like you know, logs not working, like you forgot to start the log daemon. That is that is a thing that organizations have faced, right? So what I love about decision trees, and it's a little hard to explain without like a graphic, um, yep. but hopefully it, it's basically like a tree structure. It's from behavioral game theory. So the beautiful thing about decision trees is, is it incorporates something from behavioral game theory called belief prompting. If you're familiar with kind of like chess wizard experts, um, a lot of what they do is they map out, well, if I make this move, my opponent will make this move in response and then I could do this or this and then they might do this or this. That is called N order thinking. Like there could be a first order thinking, which is just how will they respond next? Second order thinking is like, again, if this, then that, then that, et cetera. Um, and then you can map it out to how many orders there are in the interaction. So the idea with belief prompting is you're prompting the person, um, the human that's whether it's a game or again, this kind of weird scenario we have in cybersecurity, it's prompting you to think about what your opponent is going to do in response to your various moves. Decision trees make that so easy because you can visually see like, okay, we start with like this thing, which is like the attacker, you know, acts as our public like cloud bucket, right? That maybe has our like 
CAD diagrams or something. I don't, I don't know, like intellectual property. And then it's like, all right, then it's kind of game over if they can steal our IP, if that's the thing you're worried about. Obviously, a mitigation would be we'll set the bucket to private. And it's like, okay, well, the attacker's not going to give up. So then they're going to go maybe to a new branch, which is they're going to try to fish like some some important person's credentials or someone who has access and et cetera. Like you just keep working through like, okay, what do we need to do in response to the attacker? And what will they do in response to our response? And you map that out basically through all the ways, or at least as many ways as you can imagine that the attacker could get to their goal. Um, and I think in an ICS case, probably where you'd want to start is something like an availability failure. Like you can't be operational because that's normally what costs your organization the most money. But the beautiful thing about these decision trees is, again, there's no experimentation required. And every single time I have conducted this exercise with organizations, there is always some sort of assumption that they had either taken for granted, like they just assumed it would always be true. And it's definitely not always true. Mm. I call those uh, twopped assumptions. This will always be true assumptions. Or there's something that they thought about for the first time during the exercise where they're like, oh, actually, the attacker could do this. Like, this is the easiest way in. And we hadn't actually ever thought about, like, this is totally unprotected right now. Um, or they'll think of, sometimes you'll have the pleasant surprise of, like, actually, we're doing more than we thought. And sometimes you'll even see, like, oh, we have, you know, six different branches the attackers could take, which represent different, like, kind of sequences of actions. And it turns out the same mitigation applies to each branch. And we haven't fully implemented it. Or we thought about it, but we didn't invest in it. Maybe that's something it's showing that it's probably going to have a good ROI. So even without conducting the experiment to get that experimental evidence, you already are developing your hypotheses mm -hmm. about how the system is going to behave in response to failure like attackers. And you're starting to figure out how to make the system better to make it more resilient against those failures too. Well, let's stay on decision trees because that's mm -hmm. kind of a good segue into I, I wanted to ask you about that. We hear them, we've had sessions at S4 where people talk about attack trees. Are decision trees the same as attack trees or is there some difference that I couldn't Yeah, decision up? trees are um, the kind of like OG description for them, again, from behavioral game theory, because behavior, like it's about economics is the study of choice, right? So it's about decision making. Um, attack trees are what I always called them initially, but because... Um, I've seen that like SREs and other software engineers are able to adapt them to non-security use cases. It's just better to call them decision trees. Okay. You can call them security decision trees if you want. Okay. No, I mean, I just wanted to make sure because I think our audience probably has seen attack trees. So that might help them understand what Makes you're sense. talking about. Um, and frankly, also uh, the open source tool that I created is called Deciduous, which I find clever because, you know, deciduous yes, trees and then decide. Right. So it's better to call them decision trees for that reason too. I, I like that. Uh, in the ICS world with the decision tree, this is one of the things that's always been challenging, I think, for us, is we have a hard exterior and a very soft, chewy interior. So if you talk about the example you gave, loss of availability, we might have a controller that could turn a key part of the process on or off. And so one of the things could be either shutting down that controller so it couldn't take that action when it should, or actually making the controller do that action. And we've had cases where these controllers have vulnerabilities that allow someone to crash them, let's say. So one line in the decision tree would be, I would think would be an attacker sends a command that causes the controller to crash. And you could patch that and that would block that line. But with these devices that lack security, you could also just send them the command to shut down. You could send them the command to uh, turn on or off. You could send them the command to reload the whole logic. Uh, you could do you could do so many things. How do you deal with something like that where it's hard to see the value in blocking one branch of the decision tree? Because as you said, the attackers will adapt and they'll just say, well, that's great. You spent all that time and money doing that. But Here's four other easy ways to get in. Because that I think that's a lot of what we're facing in our world. I do feel like there's often this kind of like fatalism or nihilism like that, where it's like, oh, well, you know, we're going to mitigate these things, but like attackers will just do something else. And yes, and also no, like attackers do like going for the squishiest victims. Obviously, with nation states, they're going to have a specific mission and they're going to have a level of resource investment they're willing to um, make for that mission. Um, mm -hmm. 
whether it's a criminal or a nation state, the point is you want to make it really hard for them. Um, in the criminal case, it means they'll probably move on to someone who's squishier. So they get a higher ROI because um, they very much care about kind of like the economics of their crime. In the case of a nation state, like I think it's honestly, it's just a almost a comforting thing to know that the attacker had to really work for it. Um, like take a Stuxnet where it was like how many O days like chained together. It's um, you want to make it really difficult. You want to make it as difficult as possible. So what I always recommend is looking at your decision tree, right? They're going to be easier options for the attacker. They're going to be things that have that higher ROI for them. Like you said, like maybe if something's just like completely open, accessible via Shodan, that's going to be their easiest way in. That mm -hmm. is the thing you should tackle, whether that's, you know, trying to implement isolation or adding some sort of like access control. Um, or I'm sure there are other ways that are more uh, domain specific that I don't even know about. Those are the ones to tackle first. Don't worry so much about like the back doors, the zero days, like all of that stuff. That's really hard for an attacker. Frankly, you are doing something right if the attacker has to use zero days against you. That is a yep. huge win. That is a job well done. The point is we don't want like the really easy stuff to allow them to win. Um, so decision trees can be very elegant in that way where you can basically organize them in terms of like easiest branch to hardest branch and show like how you will um, frustrate the attacker. And I, I mentioned the word frustrate because um, there was this paper I actually read um, just this past week where they showed, it was kind of studying a red team. They showed that attackers definitely feel emotions when they're attacking. And one of the biggest ones is frustration. Uh, when something isn't as easy as they thought, when something is confusing, um, when they feel like they aren't getting the access that they thought they would. So as much as we can frustrate them, that's better. They start making more biased decisions, more irrational decisions, and that gives us, us more opportunities to detect them as well. Yeah, I think you you mentioned that a few times, especially in the ephemeral part of the book where you say if, if all of a sudden they had access and then they lost it, that, that is a very frustrating day for an attacker. Yes. I, I think um, – the book is very clear that if we force them to use zero days, that's that's almost a win. I, I and I agree with you that I think the challenge in our area is if there's five squishy things, what's the value? What's the value in addressing one? But let me ask that maybe a different way. What do you think about these security checklists? We could use like the the CISA's um, cybersecurity performance goals as as one category. Do you think? those are things we should be using? Do you see value in those or how would you consider those if you were consulting with a company? I am not a fan of checklists. Um, well, I am and I am not. They are better than nothing. Um, we certainly see that in healthcare. If uh, the design of a system or a procedure is poor um, and humans have to completely figure it out on their own, checklists are very helpful reminders. Um, I don't think most checklists in cybersecurity are really used as reminders. They're more like strategic guidance. And that I think is pretty dicey mm -hmm. um, and not something we see so much in other domains. I do think it also distracts. It's kind of like, um, was it the standardized test where your knowledge is then tied to whatever the test is testing for? And I feel like it's very similar to checklists, right? Um, there's another great paper by Josiah Dykstra and a bunch of people basically shows like, even if you follow, let's say like compliance checklists, hundred percent, you still have like very critical security gaps, right? So I feel like checklists can often lure us into a feeling of false sense of comfort. Like, oh, we've done a good job, but really have we? And I know the the people who write the checklist super well-meaning. They're trying to make everything better. I think in practice, though, it often means that we neglect some of the more obvious things or the things that may make sense for our own domain because inherently checklists have to be genericized, right? Um, and that's something, again, I tried to really emphasize in the book is like, I can talk about a lot of this stuff, but a lot of it comes down to like, what is your local context, right? Like you said, like mm -hmm. they're going to be very like your organization specific things that are going to be the first things that you should fix, even though for most other organizations, it's going to be something different. Um, again, that's where I think decision trees can be helpful because it, you think about your own local context um, and what would be kind of the combination of like easy for an attacker and also meaningful to you in terms of impact. Um, so I think the long and short is, yeah, checklists, they are better than literally nothing, but I think they can guide our strategy astray and should be treated at best as like reminders of like, oh yeah, okay, let's make sure like there's nothing on the checklist that kind of prompts us to think about a mitigation that maybe we don't already have in place, right? Um, that's, yeah, no, that that makes sense. And I like the the idea that they're not really helpful for strategic 
purposes. I, I think that's dead on. And if you would run into, and we see this a lot again in our world where definitely a good practice, you can't say it's a bad thing to do on that's on the checklist, but if you were to write out all the decision trees and see which decision or which bad actions it would stop, you'd say, well, really nothing. So we spent all this time and money to deploy it, maintain it, and it's really not getting us anything. Um, but it seems to be carrying the day. Let's let's move to the other part of the E. So we had evaluation and experimentation. <laughs> and your lesson number one will make people in our world very happy. Lesson number one is start in non-production environments because that scares, I think, everyone, if I'm reading your book correctly, but it terrifies uh, the people in our world that what you're oh, going yeah. to put traffic on my network, you're going to intentionally see if something bad happens. Uh, but the, I guess the question that you probably get this a lot is how realistic does the non-production network need to be to, to really give you accurate answers and not give you a false sense of resilience? Right. Um, I think there, there's definitely a trade-off between like fidelity and cost and effort. And certainly when you're starting out, I think it is much more important to get the muscle memory around experimentation, to get comfortable with it, to reduce that fear level, um, replace the fear with confidence. So my view is like fidelity can come later. Uh, certainly a lot of organizations that don't deal with critical infrastructure when they've started their own chaos engineering journey, just like software companies, they still don't start out in production and eventually they do. Um, but even they have to get comfortable with it first, right? So I definitely think for when you're starting your experimentation journey, you want to start really small. You want to start with, again, those kind of like obvious assumptions you think always hold true. Like, yes, we definitely have like a password requirement on this system, like really basic things, right? Um, or one example I give is because I built a tool for this on my employer's compute platform, Passless Compute Platform, is like make sure your login page actually requires like cookies or authentication headers, or it doesn't require or doesn't allow cross origin requests, like really basic things just so you get comfortable with it. That is the best place to start. So, in terms of fidelity, um, you know, you can use something like I just mentioned, like a serverless function that is able to like duplicate the request. And that way it's not messing with your real traffic at all. Actually, it's like doing its own experimentation logic, um, kind of like in this virtual shadow realm over there. So that's that's always comforting, I find, for organizations. Then there's also like a staging environment. You probably already want that to make sure that your changes don't cause you know, performance problems and other issues or just some sort of test environment. That's also fine, again, to get started. Over time, you can make sure, again, whatever environment you have is closer to high fidelity. Certainly things like digital twins can be extremely useful mm -hmm. in this regard. Yes. But I personally feel like a lot of people miss the point when they think about like perfection and accuracy and everything. It's still like, even if you don't have a perfectly like accurate replica of the environment, you're still gonna learn something, right? Um, no, it won't be a perfect representation of exactly how the failure will unfold in the system, but it's definitely going to teach you something. And especially when people start out, this is something Aaron has definitely, uh, Aaron Reinhardt, who contributed the case studies in my book, um, he's emphasized this too, which is like the things you're going to learn at the very beginning of your journey are going to shock you. It is going to, it's like shaking your foundational beliefs about your systems, right? Um, in his example, it's like they found the firewall only worked like 60% of the time. For a misconfigured port, that's something that's kind of like on the tin is supposed to detect all of the time, right? So a lot of your like very uh, held dear assumptions won't hold true. And that's really important to learn. So I really think it's one of those things like once you get comfortable with it, then you can start worrying about like fidelity, running things continuously, running things in production if you want, but don't worry about it until you get comfortable with it first. And just a follow-up question on that. Do you see people when they've run these tests in non-production system, test systems or whatever, staging systems, do they then later on run them in production? Do they like do a tiered thing? We're going to try it here, make sure it doesn't cause a problem and then verify it in production. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think what I've seen also, it can be really helpful to, again, nurture um, better test or staging environments anyway, which teams want for a bunch of reasons. Um, I've certainly seen, there's often a migration path where, again, it starts out with what's called game days. This is very kind of like manual chaos exercise where it's almost like a manual deploy where it's like very heavy handed and like lots of documentation, which recommend 
in general, um, whether it's a game day or not, um, and very almost like, yeah, we did it sort of energy. Um, and then you figure out like, okay, how can we automate this experiment just for like every time someone, you know, pushes a new release before it gets deployed in production, like let's run this experiment, some sort of automated workflow. Um, and then from there, yeah, they can start to maybe, um, you know, I'm not, I'm actually not sure how common this is in ICS. <clears throat> It would certainly apply to anything where you have like a bunch of different nodes, but you could take a sub um, section of your population and just run the experiment no. there in production. Like don't deploy it to everything at once and just see how those do. Again, gain comfort with it. Um, generally what I've seen, like the biggest problem that people face in adoption is definitely they overcomplicate things too quickly. They require too much investment upfront. Um, and this is something where even starting small, you can get a good ROI and don't poison um, what could be a really valuable practice before um, it has a chance to kind of like blossom, like just because it's just too much for your engineers at the time. So that's my thing. It's like, it really is not in your best interest to try to do the big bang. Like, look, we're running it in production and it's all these crazy yeah. tent. Like, no, don't worry about that. Yeah. Well, and I'm talking with Kelly Shortridge and in your book, Security Chaos Engineering, Sustaining Resilience in Software and Systems, there was a, a part that actually surprised me quite a bit. You know, in chapter eight, I, you know, I already said chapter two was my favorite. Chapter eight goes into great detail on experimentation, uh, both at conceptually and then in several different environments, you give examples of it. So I thought that was a very practical, useful chapter uh, for people to read. But I was surprised, um, and let me start maybe with a quote. You said the architectural assumptions you challenge with security chaos experiments need not be earth shattering or colossal in shape. And, you know, I was like, okay, I knew that, but I, did, I didn't know that they could even be really simple. You gave an example early on. Um, some of the experiments were quite small, a misconfigured port. So that could be your experiment is I'm just going to misconfigure this port and see what happens. That, that I think surprised me. I always thought chaos was going to be this, um, you know, this gigantic stuff we're going to throw at it and see how it responds. And, and another thing that I was surprised at was you really, the experiments are anything but chaotic. You know, you really stress that they follow the scientific method. I have this question, I have this hypothesis, this is what I expect to happen and such. And, and I was just thinking that if I go up to someone and I say, I wanna run security chaos engineering, it might freak them out. But if Don't I show them- Use resilient stress tests, that's my recommendation. Resilient, <laughs> resilient stress tests and also just say, this is exactly what I want to do. This is what I expect to happen. Um, I'm assuming you get much better responses to that. Definitely. I uh, I have told some of the people who came up with the chaos engineering uh, lingo that I firmly disagree with their decision. If I had a time machine, I would go back and just call it resilient stress test because to be honest, every other domain does it. And I know that probably a lot of people listening know that you all conduct resilient stress tests for your systems. They're just not kind of often in the software realm, right? They're going to be like physical um, mm -hmm. making sure like with a dam, like making sure it can withstand like a crack or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly in financial services, we have like the federal reserve conducting resilient stress. We see it everywhere. Um, it is not uncommon. I think the key thing that I guess, like you said, like it's not about creating chaos. It's kind of accepting that our systems are chaotic. They're non-linear systems. Again, they're complex systems. And the point is we're trying to reveal how the system behaves end to end. We're trying to be scientists, trying to generate evidence of the system's behavior so we can learn from it. There really is no point to conducting these experiments unless it is to learn from it, unless it is to, uh, to drive like design improvements, practice improvements. Um, I would not recommend using it to like create new policies because um, those may not be followed. So again, it's, it's very much about being able to learn um, and using that evidence specifically to drive that kind of feedback loop. So yeah, it's not about breaking anything in production. It's definitely not about just like making everything a mess. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite it's <laughs> to try to prepare for messes in the future and recover from them better. And is it a surprise? That's what I couldn't figure out. Are, are people surprised when they happen? Are we testing the, are we stress testing the human as well? Or yes. is this something where everyone knows it's coming and, and is ready for it? 
definitely recommend much like a software release, letting people know, um, giving them a heads up, certainly treating it like a software release where you have documentation. Um, you know, you may have like a Slack channel about it. Um, there are a bunch of ways to set up, but yes, the whole idea is, you know, we have socio-technical systems, right? And sure, you can conduct an experiment like the misconfigured port and see like, oh, it didn't generate alert as we thought. Okay, let's see you make a design change and now it generates an alert. But so what, right? The system can still fail, even though an alert was generated. A human has to digest that alert out of probably thousands of alerts and be able to take action. And so you really want to look again at that end-to-end -end picture, which involves the socio part of the system, the humans, and the technical part of the system, all of the machines and silicon things. Um, and you don't really have a full picture without both of those elements. So no, the human shouldn't be surprised that it's happening. I mean, you can do that if you'd like. And it's certainly when it's continuous, it's not like it's going to be top of mind for the humans all the time. The humans are going to be plenty surprised. Uh, I think what we've seen a lot of the time, especially early on in your experimentation journey, is that the humans, again, like, wow, the firewall didn't fire an alert. Like, that is a thing that we thought would happen. What's fascinating about that case, it's the first case study in the book um, in Chapter 9, if anyone wants to read it, is that their, like, commodity configuration management tool caught that misconfigured port change. So they did actually catch it. It was just with a completely different tool. So I like to say that's a surprise in a really great way. Um, so you're definitely going to be surprised regardless. And the point is definitely not to scare people or spook people or do like a gotcha where you're like, ha ha ha, you were unprepared. Not the point at all. The point is to help everyone that interacts with the system learn more about the system so that the mm -hmm. system can be better prepared for failure in the future. And the nice thing about that example in chapter nine is you actually show here was the, here was the decision tree. And after we got the information, here's the revised decision tree. Mm -hmm. And you show that that happened, but they probably went back and looked at the firewall as well, I would guess, and and tried to deal with that branch of the decision tree not doing what was expected. Yeah, I can't remember if Aaron used decision trees at the time. Um, I would have to ask him, but I think it was it definitely challenged again their fundamental assumptions and they had to go back and see, like, okay, what's going on with the firewall? Yeah. And certainly they knew that, okay, the configuration management tool is now a source of evidence for these kind of attacks that we need to be um, considering. So again, it very much influenced kind of their end-to-end -end understanding of the system. Let me hit one more area that um, I think is important and, and probably the one area in security chaos engineering that I had the toughest time understanding. I'm not sure I still have it. And that's the danger zone. Cue yes. the music. But um, you, the danger zone was when you had a system that had tight coupling and complex interactions. Yeah. So maybe you can describe the danger zone and, and why it deserves that name. Sure, so this will be a little lengthy, but I think it it, it is important. So yeah. um, we already talked about how our systems are complex. So what does that mean, right? Um, what it means is basically like, we don't have like a linear kind of narrative, right? Like think about me trying to go you know, imagine that we were meeting up in New York City, right? And I'm leaving through my door. It turns out there's so many things that could, hap could happen on the way to that meeting that could make me late. It is impossible to say that there's linear action. It is not like A directly causes B, causes C, right? It's like A could cause B or C or D, and that could cause a bunch of things. It's just like a lot of things are interacting with each other um, and influence each other, right? So that's, that is the I think the key element of complexity is think about it is just like it's a bunch of stuff interacting, right? The difference is that doesn't mean that that alone could lead to catastrophe because um, what you can have is what's called loose coupling. And that means that things aren't so interdependent. Um, it means that maybe there's good isolation. So Charles Perrault, who talked about this in his book, Normal Accidents, brought up, this is no longer true, by the way, but the postal service used to be like, if one post office caught on fire, you know, hopefully that never happened all the other postal offices would be fine, right? The postal system would still work. It's a very complex system in a way, um, especially like once, you know, in our more modern age, but it means that you kind of had things like relatively independent and isolated. And there are good examples of this in software as well, where um, like, again, let's say you're using serverless functions or certainly if you are sandboxing things, right? Firefox has been really big on sandboxing stuff and uh, using a sandboxing tool called RLbox, which is like, a WebAssembly sandbox, like a memory membrane, so to speak, where they wrap up all their like stinky C code. It's great, means they don't have to worry about OD anymore. That's an example where like the Firefox browser is incredibly complex, right? You have all these like weird interactions happening. 
but because they've sandbox these things, it means that like a failure in one thing won't cascade to the others, right? You have that kind of like separation of concern, mm -hmm. so to speak, that looser coupling. On the other hand, um, we have tight coupling, um, which is when things are extremely interdependent. You can have this with like um, a very linear system. So think about um, like an assembly line, I think is the classic example where it's like, there's tight coupling because even though kind of like things proceed in a very prescribed series of steps, if one element of the sequence messes up, well, probably the whole thing is going to mess up. It's like highly interdependent where mm -hmm. B depends very heavily on A. And if A can't complete its work, then B probably won't be able to proceed. Problem is then when we get that tight coupling where things are highly interdependent and then we have complex interactions where things are like interacting in surprising ways that could baffle us. It means that we have those like avalanches of failures. It means that when a failure happens in one component, we actually can't totally predict how it's going to propagate to all of the other components because of the tight coupling. And it means it's much more likely to lead to like the meltdown scenario, right? So classic example of like tight, tightly coupled system and complex is a nuclear reactor. And it's actually gotten better over the past few decades, but certainly back um, in the day, like the 1970s, like Failure in one component could very easily cascade to the rest. Or another great example I love is um, on an airplane, there was a coffee maker that happened to, like the way it was seated on the plane, it was too close to the electrical equipment. So when the coffee maker shorted out, it actually like caused the plane to nearly crash. Um, so those are examples of like how there are these kind of like unintended interaction, these like surprising baffling things. It's just like things are interacting way too much in a way that we don't fully understand. And when they're tightly coupled, whether that's physical proximity, logical proximity, um, have some sort of like mutual interdependence, that is when you're much more likely to see like failure propagate from A to B to all these places we can't even anticipate. So if we want to sustain resilience, the idea is we want to move away from the danger zone. That either means we have to loosen the coupling, make things more independent. That doesn't mean pure independence. That's nearly impossible, I think. Um, but it does mean we want to have things like isolation. Uh, we want to make sure that there's things like standardization, just anything that means that, again, failure in one thing can't really cascade to another thing um, to make it so that um, basically the effects and the interactions are more separated. Mm -hmm. um, with tight coupling and loose coupling, um, or sorry, complex interactions versus linear interactions, the idea is we want to get it more like a in this way i think i talk about like a mr potato head where it's like well you stick the arm in the thing it's like pretty straightforward right there's not much else you can do yeah. um so that's about getting much more to like single purpose components um so if you think about um i don't know take any sort of like i guess ics system right like, like let's say you have billing because you have customers probably you want to make sure that one you have one dedicated service just to billing that way it doesn't really interact with the other things. You know exactly what it's going to do. It proceeds in much more of a linear fashion, right? So it's like the more you can kind of like do those two things in conjunction, I give a ton of opportunities in the book on how you can do this. The more you move away from that danger zone, because it means that failure is just not going to propagate very much. It's going to stay contained in like a single component. Or if it does propagate, like you'll be able to track it. You'll be able to understand it. You can prepare for it better. So that's a very long explanation. I don't know if that helps clear it up. No, it, it does help. And as you were talking about the coupling, I, I think that probably resonates quite a bit with our audience um, because they think of this in engineering quite a bit that they want certain systems to work even if other systems are unavailable or not exactly. working properly. So they understand that they probably we probably haven't thought enough about it in our information systems, you know, ITOT, whatever you want to call it. We haven't really taken that thinking, but I think if they expand their thinking that they've classically done on the coupling side, they should do it. I, I do want to point out that you note in your book, in many places, that some of these things will reduce efficiency. Mm -hmm. So they, they will affect you in the short run, but probably offer you benefits in the long run. So that's, you know, that is one of the costs to doing this is if you make things less tightly coupled, it probably will mean they will be somewhat less efficient in, in many cases, probably not all. Um, I'll let you speak to, yeah, 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 I'll let you speak to that. Why don't you speak to that? And then also, what am I not asking that is really important? Is there something else that you really want to talk about to the people that run factories and pipelines and water treatment plants and all those good sorts of things? 
That one I'll have to think about for a bit. Certainly on the efficiency side, sometimes there are opportunities to kind of improve resilience, whether that again is like generally with looser coupling can be the case, but certainly with linearization, there are opportunities to improve efficiency. Um, one example I love is Netflix's Wally, which is a paved road. There are a few examples of paved roads I've talked about in various places, um, but with them, they basically, they had checklists um, for their engineers, software engineers, where before they did a release, they had to go through this whole list of like all the security mm -hmm. stuff they had to worry about. So what Netflix did is they basically built this framework um, where they turned essentially the checklist items into like security properties and the framework is called Wally. So what they were able to do to keep a long story short is basically embed as much of that kind of like security logic into this framework. You could basically, when you were deploying, just say like, yes, I will use Wally and I have all these concerns handled for you basically. And so that's a great example of like, they loosened the coupling um, hmm. because there's coupling we don't always think about, which is like an engineer to particular project or the security team to like software releases. That's, very tight coupling, actually. So they were able to like make things more secure, more performant, improve like release velocity. Like it was kind of a win, win, win all around. And I firmly believe there are a lot of opportunities like that, but certainly in the short run, what looks like efficiency can actually be tight coupling that ends up fomenting more failures, which obviously if you have to like take the time to do instant response and re-architect or refactor your system, like ultimately that's not very efficient, right? Right. So, to me, there's certainly, there's more effort involved a lot of time in this kind of resilience approach, um, especially you have to be more thoughtful about design. Um, you can't just kind of like check boxes and check out. It's not the most convenient strategy, right? It's kind of, it's a model that I actually think is very inspiring for life where it's like we best invest in ourselves to make it easier for our future selves. I think that's a very powerful kind of way to think about it. Um, so that's, I think it, the answer, unfortunately, as I say, a lot of the time is it depends in terms of whether it's going to be better for efficiency or not or per for performance or not. But certainly in practice, um, I know Nicole Forsgren, um, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, she's done a bunch of research. I think you know her of her as well. Mm -hmm. um, I know that her state of DevOps survey found that organizations who have loosely coupled architectures are, I think, three times as likely to meet their reliability targets. And that's, I think, pretty indicative of how it ends up in practice. It's generally a win-win. In terms right. of what you haven't asked about that could be relevant to this audience, I think a big one um, is that speed is necessary for adaptation. That is something where our adversaries have an asymmetric advantage is because they can adapt quickly. Um, they have these kind of speedy change processes. They remain nimble. I think that's something that's often missing in the ICS space because mm -hmm. there's a sense that, you know, we need these heavier handed processes to make things safer. That doesn't always turn out to be true in practice. Again, experiments can reveal this. But I think another thing is really thinking about local context. And as you pointed out, this is probably something everyone listening already knows, just not in the information or like logical side of things, right? Which is we have to respect the user's local context. If something's confusing, like I think was a Three Mile Island where it was like, the correct blinky light that they should have paid attention to was like on the backside of the panel and there were a bunch of other lights blinking. It's like, how is it actually reasonable to think that a human would be able to know, aha, this is the one blinky light out of like a dozen that we should be paying attention to. And it's the one behind, like on the other side of the panel, it's absurd, right? And I think we can understand that in that example, uh, by the way, the humans were still blamed back in the day for that. That has since been corrected, luckily. But a lot of times we still blame the human um, when it comes to cybersecurity stuff. And that's kind of an, a convenient uh, explanation for us, but it doesn't actually change things. So I think whenever we're tempted to blame human error, be like, oh, the human made a mistake. It's, well, where was the design confusing? Where was a process maybe confusing? Where is something where we could standardize the practice a bit better? Where can we create like this paved road that can make the secure way the easier way? Um, how can we infuse more security by design so the humans don't have to think about it, right? I think that is, I guess this is less of a question, but it's more of a call to action that the human error thing nope. like really is doing us a disservice, not just in terms of like our reputation with other stakeholders, but also frankly, in terms of security outcomes, we will never improve security if we're just expecting humans to behave in an unhuman way. We're just, we are sticking our heads in the sand at that point and not accepting that humans will make mistakes. Um, frankly, one of a humanity's strengths is that we are adaptive. 
Now we do things differently in different times. We're incredibly resourceful and creative. We should appreciate that strength and we shouldn't try to excise it from our user base, in my view. Yeah, it's funny when I was reading Security Chaos Engineering on my Kindle, I've read it on the Kindle, I highlighted so many passages. You have a lot of great lines in there, some of them more applicable to your to your theme but uh, than others, but that part about the humans, I highlighted that because I see that as a flaw. We're, we're actually heading in the wrong direction. We're asking them to do more and more and more. And, you know, you even talk about security culture as as probably something that will fail and security awareness and all this. And in my line has always been, how do I remove the burden of security exactly. from from almost every role except for the security people? themselves. And even then I would like to lower their burden, but they're, they're, I think people, if they read this book, they will find obviously the, the main theme of the book comes throughout, but there are a lot of gems in there throughout the chapters that are, are kind of little side gems that I, I found. Uh, Kelly, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Obviously people can buy security chaos, engineering, sustaining resilience in software and systems, wherever fine books are sold, as they say. Um, in terms of sites or or contacting you or or reading what else you read in terms of articles, what's the best place for people to uh, stay in touch with your content? Yes. Um, so I have info at kellyshortridge.com, like my name. That is a great place to reach me. Um, I also have a site, which is unsurprisingly kellyshortridge.com, which has all my like academic papers and blog posts and all the places I've spoken, like S4. Um, so if you want more of the resilience revolution you can check that out too and i would say i mean i i don't want to say it reflects your value your topic is not directly in our line it definitely affects our line but i would say about once every two months one of the something you've written makes my friday news and notes um your articles are always very interesting and, and usually have a unique point of view or one that i hadn't thought of or considered so i'd i'd uh, tell people they should follow her on linkedin too, because she puts a lot of, of links to her content up there as well. Kelly, thank you very much for being on the show and, and best of luck with the book. Thank you so much. And thanks for the great questions.